Good morning, good afternoon, and thank you for tuning in to our second technical session for the day. My name is Mo Farid. I'm the Global Engineering Manager for Systems and Front-End Engineering within Oil Field Equipment. And I'm honored to be joined by our two panelists for today, Barbara Thompson and Travis McNeil. Barbara is our Early Engagement Business Delivery Leader for the Americas region and brings more than 35 years of experience in multidisciplinary system solutions and deep water projects. Travis is our lead systems and front end engineer for the Americas region and brings more than 10 years of solid experience with design and execution of subsea production systems. Barbara and Travis will take us through a journey that starts early in the project life cycle and systemically through collaborative engagement with our clients links the inputs to the outputs towards successful project delivery. That leads to an enablement of projects that may otherwise be technically or economically suboptimal. The key to this enablement is to adopt an outcome-based approach to systems engineering, where considerations such as operability, intervention and life of field requirements and decommissioning are robustly linked to front-end activities such as design, field development planning, reservoir requirement, and installation considerations. Travis and Barbara, over the next 20 minutes, will lay our methodology to, doing, um, to undertaking subsea systems engineering cohesively. In other words, our subsea connect methodology that pivots off our world-class technology and services portfolio to enable projects safely and efficiently and on time. After the session, we will be opening questions. So please send your questions through during the session and we will be reading those to our panelists after the session. Enjoy. Barbara, over to you. Thanks so much, Mo. And thanks everybody for joining in. I hope you've been looking at the previous um, episodes. This is season one of Subsea Connect, episode two. And um, I think I'd love to tell you about this journey, but it's also going to be a story. It's not a fairy tale, but it does have a happy ending. And Travis will be sharing that with you in a few moments. But I think I'd like to start by setting the scene. He was mentioned today by Neil and Paul. We've had a rough 2020 because of the double black swan. We know what those all are about. But we've been digging ourselves out of the hole from 2015 and 2019 was actually very solid and we were looking for the same thing in 2020. As we move towards the end of 2020 though, we're seeing some significant activities start to build up. And if you think about it, there may be some pent up demand starting in quarter one of 2021. So many of you right now be thinking about, well, I have a project, could be happening soon. I don't know what's gonna to take to jumpstart it. I need to think about it. And I'd like to present some things to you for that thinking. You know that a number of these projects are very challenged on delivery and cost overruns. So I'd like to talk to you now about how we can change that trajectory for you. Thinking back to how projects are executed, Neil spent quite a bit of time on this, and so did Amanda and James. The traditional way of doing a project to be agnostic. I think there's a common thought that that's the way to get the best open-ended, open-minded decision. But often it has so many handoffs. We start out from the beginning with, you have a reservoir, you think it might be commercial, let's do concept screening. We could do that in-house if we're a large IOC. We may subcontract out to a really good engineering company and they're very good. They do a concept study, then they go into feed. And at that point they say, okay, now we know we wanna order equipment. So they'll come to someone like Baker Hughes and say, we'd like to order this equipment or maybe this bundle of equipment. And at that point, we have absolutely no ability to influence the decisions because they've been made by somebody else. Well-meaning other people, but every one of those steps takes time. And when you take time, you extend the first production. And that's one of the first enablers of Subsea Connect is to try to accelerate that production. So what if we reimagine this such that we were part of that team? You heard Amanda and James talk about that quite a bit. We have exports in, experts in reservoir, in front end design, and people that can do what this particular topic is talking about, systems thinking. And if we do that, we need to do it in early engagement. So what if instead of having all those handoffs, we put that in one continuum where the team started working from the beginning? It's amazing, we've seen in some of our workshops that Two reservoir engineers, maybe one working for the operator and one working for Baker Hughes, may look at the same amount of data and say, I would do it this way. And the other person says, but 
I've seen it done this way as well. Things that would not have been generated if you're handing things from one team to another. Because that team's together, they're speaking the same language from the beginning, and they're more likely to come up with solutions as a team, and they buy into the collaboration. What do you get out of this? You get certainty. Technical certainty, cost certainty for sure, and a certainty that you can deliver on time because you're not doing those handoffs and going from one step to the next. And we know that moving to the left on first production is very important. So that's the when of this. What about the how? If you think about what does it mean to have a vendor-led solution? And honestly, we're more than vendors, we're solution providers. So if you look at those teams on reservoir and subsurface, looking at lean well construction, looking at what we can do in the subsea production, and also looking at what we can do with a partner. We have flexible partnerships with surf providers. Neil talked a little bit about that. We are flexible to address the concerns of our customers. We may work with some surf providers in some certain stances and some in others. But the point is, let's put the best people and what's right for the project on the team from the beginning, put them all together. And that is the very definition of what we call Project Connect. All working together from the beginning and through the entire assess, select, define, develop, and operate cycle of what a project should do. And what are the benefits? Accelerated production, we've heard that a lot. There's also lower tow techs and maximized recovery. So let's start with accelerated production. What does that look like? One of the things I really love about being in the oil and gas industry is that no two projects are the like. So if you look at accelerated production and what it does to get there, you have to start thinking about the entire project from the beginning as a team. And you put those systems together and you think about field development planning, you think about installation, you think about how am I gonna operate this facility? What am I gonna do over the life of the field? One of the really cool things about the differences in all the upstream projects is how varied they are in water depth. What, is it oil, is it gas? Is it gonna be harsh weather? What kind of infrastructure do I tie into and how far away is it? When you think of the systems we put together, we've already re-looked at this and came up with eight archetypes that we think is a great starting place with your system. Not just looking at the equipment, we're looking at how it all works together. Remember, we're talking about the reservoir all the way to the top sides. And we'll be thinking about things like, long-term, do we think we're gonna have to have intervention? What are the fluid characteristics that are gonna drive that? And those system thinkings are brought in from the beginning in those architectures. Now, these beginning archetypes that we start with may not be the end, but it's where we can start. And here's another element in which we can use to speed up getting to first production because we've thought about it before, and then as a group, we can look at it. Now, let's talk about TOTEX. This is an interesting concept. Many of us think about CapEx because it's a big number. We have major capital projects. And when you think about CapEx, it kind of dominates the entire scenery. We're all looking to reduce costs. How can we get there? Because we think it has a very, and it does, if you look at the formulas, a very strong influence on MPV. But what if we designed something that was terribly terrific, but it was hard to install? Or in fact, in one case, I was on a project where it looked really nice on a drawing, but unless we taught dolphins on how to put these things together, we were never gonna get the flying leads in with our equipment. So what do we need to do? We need to think about the installation, how we're gonna operate it, and then finally, how we're gonna abandon it from the beginning. And it's highly likely that if you thought of all of those at once and not just the CapEx and how the equipment and different equipment went together, James even mentioned that we were willing to accept another vendor's equipment if it was right for the project because we were looking at the total project, not just the CapEx. So if these came together like that, the overall TOTEX and the um, net present value and everything else would be so much more improved. What does it take to get there though? From the customer side, we need to have a conversation in the beginning of what we can see as fit for purpose solutions for the reservoir, for the subsea. What do we need to do? Neil talked about this today. We have to embrace a low risk and take some skin in the game. We talk about that with commercial models, performance-based, outcome-based, how does that work? And is that the right way to go about it? If you think what happens in the end then, we have a common culture of let's get this done right. We look at the economics and the outcome more than we do is just the numbers that, that build up in a list. And during the systems part of this, we're thinking about the operating conditions, what are the fluid characteristics, interfaces with power controls, other things that we're not looking at right now, but that we know we'll need to, that needs to be all there from the beginning. 
So that that's the look at Totex. Now for, to me, the big prize is looking, let's look at maximize production and recovery from the well. Probably if you haven't studied Baker Hughes, you may not understand the depth and the breadth of what we have in terms of solutions, equipment, and know-how. I think it's been mentioned today, we have Gaffney Klein, maybe not mentioned Zio Consulting, but people that understand reservoir and economics that we can bring from the beginning. We also have talked about the well construction, the completion, the subsea equipment, the artificial lift. Let's look at what we can do on the top sides. We can touch 80% of your reservoir and your production. Think about that. 80% of that, there's something that we can do to influence that. So while we're looking at maximizing production and lowering costs, let's think about this. Say you had a development that was small asset, $50 million, produced 20,000 barrels a day. In today's market, you save 10% on that. That's one-time savings of $5 million. But if you increase the production by 10%, then you have 2,000 barrels per day. And that adds up to about $30 million per year additional revenue for over the life of the project, not just one year. It's an enormous number. So why shouldn't we focus on that just as much as we focus on the reduction of capital? There's two levers we can do. Pull up on the recovery, pull down on the cost and doing those together. That's when we really get deeply thinking about system operability, and the things that we can do for customers. So in thinking about that, we've actually done this for some customers and you'll find out in the next couple of weeks, the technology that we pivot from, where it looks at the Aptara Totex light, it looks at production chemistry, the digital solutions are very exciting, but all those come together to bring the happy ending that I'm gonna turn it over to Travis now to bring for you. Travis? Thank you very much, Barbara, and hello, everyone. So let's show you how, you how we put into practice the strategies and philosophies that Barbara just spoke of, combined with the ones that James and Amanda spoke of earlier. So here's a real world example of a case study here in the Americas. So a client came to us looking to reduce their project cost. What they were really interested in wasn't just cost reduction. What they were really interested in were ways to maximize their project's profitability. So how do we at Baker Hughes help? Well, we can't just look at our equipment and our services. To do so in the most efficient and effective manner, we have to look at how our selections impact the greater system. How do we affect things like rig time and OPEX and recovery? How can we simplify the tieback? Can we implement any alternative commercial models to move the economic needle? All of these things are extremely important, and they're just a sample of the things that we think about in a study. The reference case project that we'll talk about today is a shallow water, low pressure, heavy oil system that's developed in two phases, three wells per phase. Nothing really technologically difficult about it. It's just economically difficult for the clients. So now let's talk about how we executed the study. We used a multidiscipline team of technical experts from the reservoir to the top side. We were all working together for what was best for the system, not for any individual silo. Our team, in just over a few weeks, generated ideas, analyzed artificial lift methods and flow line sizes, checked interfaces, simplified the search system, and verified its installability. Again, all for what's best for the system and not any individual product. Now, let's take a look at the study results. We added devices down hole to improve recovery. We simplified the casing program and are using an alternative mud. We simplified the tree cap and eliminated numerous lines back to the host, all of which was analyzed by flow assurance and verified to local capabilities. Now, as you can see, this results in a much simpler, more efficient system, but this system has the exact same functional capabilities as the system that you saw previously. But this one has a much higher NPV, IRR, and at lower cost. Now, really great work by the team here, and we received a lot of great feedback from our clients as well. So in closing, Subsea Connect is how we deliver these three enablers that James spoke of earlier. However, all of these 
are driven by systems thinking such that we see what our clients see so that together we can move the economic development points of projects. Thank you for listening. And I will now turn it back over to Mo and we will go through your questions. Mo. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Travis and Barbara, for the very insightful presentation there. Very, very, um, a lot of great input. And uh, we've received some really good questions from our audience. So let's start with the first question, uh, mostly for you, Barbara. So what is the motivation from a client perspective to move away from traditional approach to using an independent engineering provider towards using an equipment and services provider to do so? I think that's a common question and it's a natural one to ask. Um, I probably felt that way in the past, but what I've found is that number one, we're not devoid of having our own field development engineers and engineers you would find in a consultant. So we do have those people. But number two, they're familiar with our equipment. They know the latest technology, they know the innovations. And it's not that the engineers at the consultant couldn't do that, but they're just not at the front face. And the other thing is we see the project all the way through the end. So we know the pitfalls of certain decisions, the partnering, the supply chain, and all those things that engineer typically in a consulting firm wouldn't be exposed to. And because we're exposed to that, we can bring those solutions. The other thing is we are so broad. I, I mentioned it earlier. I don't know many engineering consultant firms that have both the reservoir techniques and the subsea techniques. Some may also do the facilities, so that's not uncommon. But to put all those together in one team that's used to working together is very uncommon. And that brings us a, a, a nice lever to pull and an advantage for the client. Now the motivation, they're thinking I'm sole sourcing. I'll just, I'll put that word out there because I think sometimes that, that brightens people. So you're thinking now, I don't have a way to get competitive pricing. But we have to start thinking about this as a solution, not as a three bids and a buy kind of environment. And what you have is cost certainty and schedule certainty. So those are trade-offs that you have to think about. And we talk about those with our clients. We absolutely do. Project Travis just talked about that was their initial motivation. I don't know that I'm going to get the best price. And now they're looking at it and thought, oh, my God, look at the money I left on the table because I didn't think of this as a holistic thing from the beginning. And it was all because you're doing a traditional model that said, I don't need to do it that way. So it, it takes a while to get used to it. But we have a number of case studies. You know, there's not enough subsea connect days in the week where we could go through all of them. But we know we can do it. Great, great. Thanks, Barbara. Um, the next question uh, for you, Travis, regarding the, the case study that you presented. So on, on the case study you presented, was there any third party technology deployed or considered for this development? How did you deal with it? And can you also elaborate on the link of subsurface to surface facilities and how you've assessed that during your early phase work? Absolutely. So I'll talk about the technology piece first. So I think it's uh, very apparent that we as Baker Hughes don't manufacture and supply everything, right? Um, so for instance, on the umbilical of the, uh, the case study, we, we worked with an umbilical provider on a number of options that we were thinking about as a system, and they fed back to us certain technical advantages, disadvantages, commercial disadvantages and advantages and we collectively were able to produce an optimal way of transporting all of those chemicals, hydraulics, you know, power and comms from the host over to, you know, the, the drill centers. So we do work with you know, third parties, our vendors, you know, as, as we need to, for sure, early on. Um, and, you know, that just enhances our ability to deliver you know, subsea systems in, in the most efficient way. Now, getting to your second question, Mo, that was regarding subsurface and integration, correct? Yeah. So it's imperative to include subsurface with the design of a, of a subsea system, because if they're not connected, you know, something's going wrong, obviously. So it's best that we work together in the way that you know those two connect in the most efficient way because subsurface selections drive you to you know where you tap into the reservoir where your top hole locations are right so that drives our subsea production system and, and the optimal you know selection of it but if you work together you can eliminate those interfaces you can analyze what sort of artificial lift methods are optimum 
because that directly links into the design of the subsea system because artificial lift has to provide what the subsea system is, is pushing back against it. So it's best that we include both of those together such that we, we create that subsea optimal system you know, fully together. Great, great. Thank you, Travis. Um, another question here, perhaps to you, Barbara. How much upcycle improvement have you seen in projects through adopting early engagement methodologies over the last few years? And how did that change during the current conditions? I would say that the way we're working right now is not changed really much during the current conditions, as long as people are willing to get together. I think we're all getting very, very good at these virtual meetings. This is a proof of it. And we've actually had some very good workshops with clients. And the nice thing about meeting online, I will say this, I prefer in person, but you don't have to worry about the size of meeting room you get. Everybody can come. And the more people to come, then the more ideas you do get to share. Now, in terms of the time and the cycle, we can make decisions pretty quickly. So from the beginning, we're talking about the lead time on the equipment, not how much time it takes to do the feed. Because, and, you know, if you can do that, you can eliminate, I would say, anywhere between six to nine months on a standard schedule. Uh, depends on the size of the development, the people involved, the partners, and the willingness to go ahead. And, of course, you have your internal decisions you have to make. But if you think about it, you have probably at least six months of handoff and dead time when you stop, rebid, stop, rebid, and then go out, you know, for your final supply chain. It takes um, a nimble pre procurement uh, group, and you want to be able to say that um, we trust what we're doing. Uh, there has to be some verification, so you have some slowdowns of time. But certainly, when we're doing from the beginning, uh, you're going to hear next week about our stocking program. And if we can build that in, and we have advanced release, that it saves even more time. And you can bring that at the very beginning of the project when you're first talking to people about that. So um, it's a range, but I think it's significant. That's why we're talking to you about it today. Great, great. Thanks, Barbara. Um, another great question. And um, how do you balance, perhaps that for you, Travis, uh, how do you balance the conflict between more onerous customer technical specifications, example, the material specifications, versus the bare bone industry standard, the minimum industry standard? Yeah, I mean, it's it's important that we take into account what the industry requires and what is absolutely necessary for the project. That That's something that we do on, on tenders as well as studies is to get down to the bare bones of what's actually required to deliver this system. In that way, we can produce and work with you all on what you're comfortable with from a risk perspective so that we can produce a system that not only you know technically works according to the specs but also something that's you know low risk according to our clients and is something that's low cost and can fit well within our structured portfolio at a, a very minimal risk development and execution yeah no that's that that's uh, absolutely absolutely travis um Barbara, I guess you, you, you linked to that uh, point earlier, but perhaps also another question is, um, a downside to early engagement is locking in bespoke solutions that may affect the general competitiveness of projects. We do that in-house. Typically, we don't get a vendor to do this. Why would we change this approach? Thinking on some of the experience that we've had, and we've done it with companies that do it in-house, and they actually, because of their techniques, their habits, uh, history of what they have, may actually be more bespoke than we are. Um, we talked a little, a couple times about the fit for purpose, and Travis just alluded to with, with the industry standards. There is a need, I think, in this industry. We've all been talking about standardization. Uh, we've addressed it with structured products, such that we can figure to order rather than engineer from the scratch. I think if a customer looks at that. And when we talk about early engagement, you know, in my discussion day, I was talking all the way back at the reservoir, which we can do that. But say you put some concepts together and you brought us in free feed. We can still take that. At that point, you still should have options. And we can look at those options and then configure. And I've seen that with some companies that actually do their own in-house. It's kind of a validation. We can come in and validate. And maybe you did it all just the way it should be. And then that's how we'll carry on. 
but in some of the workshops we've held with customers, like a couple I come come to mind, um, they were surprised at some of the answers we had. And we made suggestions. We didn't say, this is our favorite, you have to buy it. We, we actually made suggestions and asked them, what's the operating principle behind this decision? You know, that gets back to a real systematic thought process. You know, um, what's the knock-on effect downhole if we did this with a subsea development? Um, that's an exciting part about where we are at Baker Hughes. And I think that's what it puts us in a unique position. Uh, so it depends on the customer's openness to do things a little bit different. And it's our openness as well. We have to be, we have to admit that maybe somebody else has a better idea too. So that, that takes both of us. And that's what the whole spirit of collaboration is. And we use that word a lot, but what does it really mean? We sit together, we become a team, we become a family, whatever it takes so we can throw everything out there. Um, and, and if everybody's willing to be open to that and do things a little bit different way, there may be some non-negotiables. Earlier, James was talking about HSC quality. Those are absolutely non-negotiables. There may just be some philosophies you have as a customer that that maybe you don't want connectors that are horizontal, you'd rather they be vertical, or you never use flexibles, you always use rigid. We have to respect that and understand what your operating history has been and why you have that. But we'll challenge it. We have operating history and, and customers as well. So it's just that openness. And I think if you're a company the size that does all your own internal concept screening, you have a lot of experts. So you've seen a lot of those things. So probably we can learn from one another. Uh, and that, that's a two-way street. But it just has to be decided. It's where we have to have the discussion. We begin to discussing it. Maybe it's not right for you to do Subsea Connect. That's fine. We'll see you at the EPCI bidding and we will bid what you want. Um, we're flexible enough to do that. Um, the other thing you can't talk about internally and maybe you don't think about, and we're having a number of these discussions is the commercial models. We haven't been that specific, but understand that because we can do reservoir simulations ourselves and we understand how these work, we understand exactly what it takes to develop and what the risks are in a reservoir. So we can take some risk on performance and outcome. Those look like different things, but you know, there's, there's just a lot of things that if you don't bring us in from the beginning, it's harder to have that discussion later on. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, next question, uh, would you say that Baker Hughes would be providing for customers, specifically small and medium ones, and integrated expertise as the larger IOCs, independent oil companies have in the workforce. And even for the larger IOCs, would you provide project dedicated perspective to increase target assurance? If that's for me, I would say, one of the things that is new in our industry, and certainly Baker Hughes embraces this, is that we're a project execution company. So in doing so, we have project services, we have project execution. We have a really cool technology that may not come up during the next several weeks, it's called RealTrack. And what it allows you to do is see in real time how your project's progressing during engineering and especially during manufacturing. Um, several years ago, not that long ago, we didn't have that. We were still just an equipment supplier trying to put this together for you. But we have real EPCI project execution experience and tools and mindset. So, you know, we could provide the project people you need, you know, proper project managers, project engineering managers, system engineers, procurement, project services. Uh, we look at tax, we look at everything it does to put a project together, and then we have operations people. And not to be um, dismissed during this, we have field service engineers that are very skilled. And if we're taking them from the beginning and pushing that out to where we start operating together, we have all that that expertise to bring in there. So I think there's something that we have for everybody that we can augment their teams. Travis, you have a little more experience on this. I mean, what would you say? Oh, absolutely. So I guess from a technical perspective, probably the thing that most clients would be most scared about is who's actually doing the work, right? And do they know what they're doing? <laughs> um, so we have a number of people in our systems engineering organization that have been on the client side, that have done the system flow assurance, that have connected the dots and delivered the, you know, the the bits and pieces all together as a unit. So trust that we're not just talking smoke, right? You know, we have people within our organization that have been there, have done that, have connected the dots, delivered systems, installed them, make sure that they're up and running and, and working. So we have within our organization good people that can that can really do this. Great, great. And I guess 
the, 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 the other part of that question, and just maybe to, to, uh, to link back to that, is that perspective around the, the size, right, between a smaller uh, and a medium, you know, uh, uh, customer into a larger IOC. So from your experience, Barbara and Travis, what would you say about, you know, that analogy between the smaller, you know, the, the size of, of, of our client and how that, you know, links to our delivery model to, uh, in that sense? Barbara? First, you want me to? I'll go. Um, I know that working for small companies, you wear a lot of hats. You're sitting here right now and you're an asset manager, you're a project manager, you have a lot to do. And you have a, you've been empowered to do a lot of things. So, but you can't do it all. And when it comes to looking at the entire system operability, um, what it takes on supply chain, what it takes to manage the entire manufacturing, the delivery, the EFATs, um, the SITs, getting all that together, you're going to need help with some of that. Now, you may temporarily hire some people to do it. That That's fine. But you'll find with this, us a complete wing-to-wing -wing capability to do that with you, not necessarily for you because it's your asset, but with you and as a as a partner joined up. And so at this, a lot of uh, independents are going into some of these brownfields and the subsea tiebacks we talked about with James and Amanda that are sub-economic, they're marginal, they're challenged. And I think that's where we can add probably the most value because then we can come in with a lot of tools and thought processes, even if you've worked before in an IOC that, but now you're working in a smaller company that you would appreciate because you had those tools before and you may not have access to as many. Great, great. You know, the other thing that I would say to your question too, Mo, is that you know we tailor our execution according to what our client is comfortable with us doing. So don't, don't think that, you know, Baker Hughes takes over the project and doesn't really talk to us and goes and delivers me something at the very end. So what we do is engage with you on what you're comfortable with us doing as part of our subsea tieback and early engagement portfolio. And that might be something that's, you know, small for a, a big company that has a lot of resources and can, can do this. Um, but it might be something that's, you know, much larger for someone that you know, it doesn't have as much horsepower to deliver the project. So we might be expanding that scope of the study and delivery for them. So, but in, in any case, we always work with our client on, on what they're comfortable with. And we work really as one team in, you know, every single study all the way through the bid, through the execution. So, yeah. Okay. Great, Travis. And while we're with you, Travis, another question on the case study uh, related. How did you handle the surf and installation aspect and linking that to the economics of the project and the enablement for that particular field? Uh, in general, considering that Baker Hughes uh, does not have an integrated surf contractor uh, like competition. No, absolutely. So this particular study was, I guess, early days, I would call it. Um, so we did not join at the hip with a surf partner yet, um, but we have included within our organization and within our systems engineering group, people that have sat in the surf contractor world have been the, the surf engineers, if you will, that have you know laid pipe and done all the analysis to, to see what's, what's really required, best requirements, um, so we, we utilize their expertise combined with our knowledge of vessels in the region to really design the subsea system to the, to the way that we're comfortable with at this stage. But knowing that once we get to the later stages with our clients, we'll want to bring on a surf partner uh, in some contractual way, be it that you're comfortable with, that we have a great relationship with, that can deliver that has the vessels that are capable for the region to make sure that they're comfortable with the, the subsea layout and how everything connects together. So we think about SURF all throughout our studies, even if we do not have a SURF partner directly involved on the study, because we have expertise that has sat in the SURF partner shoes. Great, great. Um, perhaps we have one time for one or two questions. Uh, Barbara, one to you. Do you consider that this approach to early engagement and vendor-led solution being the norm, especially for uh, smaller and medium-sized operators, um, or do you still see room for different approaches to approaching projects? 
That is, that's thought provoking. And if you haven't caught on today, you'll find out from us that one size doesn't fit all. I think Travis was just talking about when it comes to serve. So it depends on the operating philosophy of, of the customer. And certainly the last thing we want to do is um, come in and run your business for you, right? It's your business and you understand what those drivers are. So we can be your partner and we can partner all the way in or we can partner for part of this. And we found out with certain customers, they'd much rather talk to us about the reservoir, the subsea equipment. I think that's just too generic. I'll just go out and bid that or vice versa. Um, they may want a, a combination of people. They may have favorites. You know how this is. We all have favorites. I'd rather use this vendor for this piece of equipment, this vendor for this piece of equipment. So, you know, we, we have some customers are like that. So we're happy to go along and then supply what they need when they need it. Um, but for those customers, if you, if you go all the way back to wind up why we started today, there are challenges in this industry on getting it across the line on the economics and the production. And we're working in a very low cost environment. We don't know what that price will be. So no one's trying to find a break-even project for $80, but that's just not going to exist. So we're looking at ways we can do it as a team. And Baker Hughes really strives, you know, with its principles to care about our people and care about our customers. And we want to grow, have growth for both of them. And we know that also our customers are going to be challenged on the energy transition. We know we have to get there. Um, some of the technologies we have weren't even available two years ago that lower our carbon footprint and do those kind of things. So we have to think about all those things we, when we come to a customer. We have to be humble, okay? Uh, been a lot of swagger here today about we can execute projects, we've got great technology. Those things are all true. But we have to have some humility when we come to our customers because at the end of the day, it's their risk, their asset, and their project. Um, and in some cases, their careers, right? So we have to take and be careful with that as we work with our customers to get them, to get them there. So we have to listen. Listening, I think, is the, is the best part of that and be able to walk away and say, okay, this isn't gonna work for you. Maybe part of it will. Um, we'll come back to another project or maybe we'll, we'll do something different next time, but thanks for your time. So I think until we have that conversation and we go through all the possibilities, then we really don't know what that answer is. We just ask you to be open and we promise to be the same. Great, great. Thank you, thank you, Barbara. I'll, uh, I'll take one last question to you, Travis. Um, the word, it's really a comment and a question. The word system was mentioned a few times. Great to see it going beyond SPS. And I'm interested in that vendor-led solution. Uh, can you elaborate more? And how can you reflect of some of that on the case study? No, absolutely. So within our organization, we're not only looking at how we structure products, but how those products fit into a structured system. So ways that we can reduce our risk in the amount of time that we have to design the layout, amount of time that we have to think about how we structure the system and the analysis required to go through the system. So we're looking at ways to structure our system as well. And actually, Ollie will be talking a little bit about structured systems next week, I believe. Um, so please tune into that if you have time. So within that feedback of what that part of our organization is doing, that really helped us drive our selection on this particular case study a lot more quickly. As I talked about, you know, the, the study only lasted a few weeks and we undertook a whole lot of, you know, engineering idea sessions and analysis to get through. So having that understanding of how things are typically done and how things have done in the past and ways that we can connect the system quite quickly helped us get to that solution much more quickly, run through the study with our client with that understanding that we, we, we've done this before and that we have a lot of uh, background that backs up why this solution should work for them. Great, great. Thank you, Travis. Um, Great, great questions, great insights. And with that, I would like to thank both Barbara and Travis for the very extremely insightful presentation. We've heard, we've touched on a number of things. We've looked at, you know, early engagement. We've looked at how we approach a system. We've put that into a case study and great interaction with our audience. So thanks everyone for that. 
please stay in for the next session where Andrew and Don will be taking what we have been discussing this morning around from, from Neil's perspective onto subsea tiebacks into early engagement and systems engineering all into action through our subsea connect through some real recent case studies so please stay stay on uh, we'd also like to remind everyone to visit our virtual solutions fair online where you can take a, a virtual dive subsea to get closer and personal with our technology enabling systems from reservoir to top sides so thank you so much again and we hope to see you soon stay safe thank you Bye, everybody